I want to start by discussing <laughs> penis size with you. <laughs> what does penis size have to do with trust? Well, everything. <laughs> for some reason, for the last 16 years since I've been in, living in Indonesia, penis size has been a recurrent topic. It was always Dutch male friends or other Western male friends that have brought it up. For some reason, they always try to warn me against dating Indonesian men. And I found out that the main reason that they did that was because they worried about their penis size. Well, let me clear this up once and for all. There's nothing wrong with Indonesian penises. Let me give you some background. I've been uh, living in Indonesia for 16 years. I was in a relationship and a marriage for a long time with the same person. And after 23 years, we broke up, and he passed away a few years ago. So, I'm back on the dating market. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a great cook, but I do have other qualities. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> Indonesia has been my hunting ground for the past few years, and I have been dating one or two or three Indonesian men. And for some reason, my male friends from Holland or other Western uh, countries wanted to warn me against this. Well, let me tell you this, my dear friends. You are not the only Superman on the planet. <laughs> of course, this all has to do with a feeling of superiority. Don't get me wrong, these friends of mine, they don't consider themselves to be racist. They live in Indonesia or they travel to Indonesia, they speak the language, they mingle with other people, with other cultures, but when it comes down to sex, tolerance is really tested, I found out. For some reason, the roosters want to prove to the chicken who have the best feathers. And one Dutch man even recently told me that he doesn't consider Indonesian men to be real men. Well, hello. <laughs> and funny enough, the other way around, it doesn't work that way. If a Western man dates an Indonesian woman, that's perfectly normal. And I would never, ever dare to say that an Indonesian woman is not a real woman. So why is that? Why do white males try to protect the herd against outsiders? Of course, it all comes down to bias. Bias towards other cultures. Bias towards other cultures is deeply rooted in human beings. Researchers have found out that even from the age of six months, babies can differentiate based on skin color. And it's even worse. If you put people from different backgrounds, different races, different ethnic backgrounds into, this, into the same school or same university, racism, prejudices, bias gets even worse. So we differentiate based on race more than we do on gender or economic status. So does this mean that after 16 years living in Indonesia, I have not managed to create trust between me and the other culture? between me and other fellow Indonesians. Well, if you look at this photo, you would probably say no. I have failed. I look totally different than my fellow Indonesians. I did try to blend in, of course, but I simply don't. I have been called, hey, mister, every single day of my life for the past 16 years. I go into a neighborhood or a village, and I already know <laughs> there's going to be this friendly gentleman who screams to me, hey, mister. And if I'm in a good mood, I say, hey, missus, <laughs> how are you? But when I'm not in a great mood, I try to explain to this gentleman that a person from the female gender is not called a mister. But of course, most of the time, I just laugh, and I know what he's trying to tell me. He's not trying to tell me that I'm a male person, he's trying to tell me that I'm a stranger. Hey, stranger, 
That's funny, that's great to see you here. I'm surprised. Can you imagine that we would do the same thing in Nijmegen, for example? We see an African woman walking on the street, and we go like, hey, mister. <laughs> Very hard to imagine, of course. But isn't that much more honest? Isn't that what we are thinking anyway? Hey, there's a stranger. So what that, in that sense, what Indonesians are doing is very honest. But being that stranger every single day of my life for the last 16 years has changed me as a person. Most of the time, I just accept the fact that I'm different. But I sometimes I'm not in the mood to be the only white alien that lands in the village. Then my face changes, my expression changes, my body language changes, and I'm just screaming one thing. I want to be invisible. Leave me alone. I don't want to be this white alien today. But of course, all the attention is always focused on me. And I'm actually, I can't complain, because in Indonesia, being that foreigner, being that white person, is still very respected. You're basically a god. You're basically good old Kuifje in Africa. <laughs> Children can up, come up to me, and they all want to kiss my hand. They only do that with their priest and imam and with the white person. And they want to take pictures with me all the time. And this is, of course, also racism, but it's a positive kind of racism. It doesn't really hurt me, but I don't want to be in that situation all the time. And this is exactly, I know that people who are considered strangers in Holland know exactly that feeling that you just want to be invisible. So how do we create this trust between us and people from other cultures? Do we know how to connect? What we basically try to do is step into someone else's shoes. It's called outrospection. Outrospection is a way of knowing oneself by creating a relationship with other humans, by creating a feeling of empathy. So basically, what I'm trying to do here is a little experiment. I want you to step into the shoes of this woman, the woman in the middle. Her name is Rosita, and if you see her, what do you think? She's wearing a headscarf, yes, so she's Muslim. What else? She looks friendly. Is she a radical, a fundamentalist? Is she a terrorist? Well, I tell you who you are. Rosita. So you, in this situation, because you are Rosita, are a friend of mine. I met you very closely after the tsunami in 2004. You lost your three children, all your children, and you lost your house, all your possessions, and you also lost your husband. So basically, you wanted to start a new life. You decided to go to Holland. And first, you started to connect to Dutch people, you started to learn the language, but you still felt that you were still a stranger. People felt, yeah, they made you feel different. There was a kind of fear, even suspicion that you felt. There was no trust. So now, you being a Rosita, how do you feel? How do you feel? Do you feel left out? Do you feel sad, isolated, lonely? not being trusted. This is basically what the experiment is all about. You feel some kind of empathy, I hope. <laughs> I hope most of you will feel some kind of empathy for her. So I haven't thought about this theory. It's a theory from a philosopher called Roman Granacek, and he actually calls the 21st century the century of empathy. In contrary, the 20th century was the century of introspection. Basically, now, we're looking out, outside. He even calls it a revolution, a revolution of human relationships. So how do we create empathy? 
How do we learn how to do that? Some people are naturally better equipped than others. But even people who have felt a lot of hatred and intolerance towards other people have managed to completely turn around and become empathic people. I can only speak for myself. This is me. <laughs> I grew up on a farm. My parents are there. <laughs> and um, the only other cultures around me were white and black sheep. I still remember when I was around nine years old, the first brown kid arrived in my village, and I was very excited about it. To me, he represented the outside world, a world that I wanted to discover. And I was wondering, where does this come from? Because from my situation, from my circumstances, there was no stimulus to do this. So I don't know where it comes from, but I wanted to travel and I wanted to find out. So I traveled to Asia when I was 21 years old, and I fell in love immediately. But I was still a stranger. And I didn't want to be that stranger. So how did I try to make this connection? How did I try to find trust? Well, first of all, I tried to look like them. Wait. Well, it doesn't go back. Anyway. Trying to look the same as an Indonesian woman, I found, doesn't help. And to be honest, a white person like me, looking like an Indonesian, looks kind of ridiculous. So I decided that's not the way to go. And through the years, I learned a different way. I basically learned that you're not going to be like them, and you're also not going to be the old person you are going to be a new person. You create a new dimension. Basically, you transform from a fearful worm into a butterfly, a new kind of humankind, a, 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 a human with new dimensions. So this is me, yes, this is me. And the difference that looks from the outside isn't there. Probably you would think, who are these people? Are, the, are these radical Muslims? Do you think that? Are they terrorists, maybe? <laughs> no, they are my neighbors. These are my old neighbors. And I know them for 15 years. We lived in the same neighborhood, in the same street. This person next to me is called Erwin. He used to be a motorbike taxi driver. We have that in Jakarta, because there's a lot of traffic. So I used him a lot, going on a motorbike from one place to the other. Now he has uh, made some success in his life, and he's running a very successful goat meat restaurant. So Erwin and a lot of other people have made me a new person by giving me trust. But it's not only the easy way. This person. He looks like a cool rock star, but this is the real terrorist. He has killed uh, over 100 Christians, and he has done one of the worst atrocities committed in Indonesia, I think. He has beheaded Christian schoolgirls during a conflict in Sulawesi between Christians and Muslims. So why do I want to step into the shoes of this monster, you want to ask? I don't know, I felt the urge to do that. And I met him a couple of times, and I was fascinated. I wanted to know, why have you become like this? Because he used to be a drummer in a rock band. And then he told me his story, and of course there's always a story. And he told me it's basically revenge. His family was murdered by Christian. And he came from an ordinary background, but he was influenced by militants, and he became a terrorist. They basically jailed him for 19 years, but he recently escaped, which is kind of worrying. <laughs> but I learned also things from him. I stepped into his shoes. So by doing this, I created a new way of thinking about people. I felt like I've now become a more complete person. 
I, I, I feel like my eyes can see more, my nose can smell more, and I feel like my soul has more layers than I had before. So I want to do this with you. I want you, just maybe today, approach a stranger and just say, hey, mister, or hi, stranger, <laughs> and try to step in that person's shoes and see what comes out of it. Maybe something great will happen after that. Talk to someone you would never, ever talk to before. And if you do that, we will all become butterflies. Thank you very much. Thank you.